Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's get into Romans chapter 12. Praise the Lord. Uh, the, we said last week that, you know, Paul, or a couple weeks ago, that the first eight chapters of Romans were dealing with doctrine. The middle three here, 9, 10, and 11, deal with God uh, and Israel. Uh, Paul speaking to the nation of Israel, and then, and then he brings it back and discusses with the Gentiles that they shouldn't become uh, arrogant or whatever about the position that they have because Israel has lost it. And then we move back into chapter 12 through the end of the book with practical application uh, of doctrine. Now, Paul always does this. When you read his letters, he'll always give you a, a doctrinal position. He'll give you a position of who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, what belongs to you in Christ, what you have in, in the sense of what belongs to you and the, what rights you have. But then he always wants to come back on the other side of that and make it practical and, and practical application of that and then give warnings against, you know, um, misappropriating or misusing that. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes, says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... <clears throat> a, re a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. King James uses the word reasonable, other translations, and really the Greek bear bears it out a little bit better, saying your spiritual service. So it is a spiritual service to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Now, folks, I just don't understand where people get the crazy idea that it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It's all okay. You're going to go to heaven. God doesn't care when he tells you, by the, by Paul writing by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost says, present your body a living sacrifice. You have to keep your body under. Say, I have to keep my body under. Hallelujah. And then he goes on and says this, be not conformed to the world, which, um, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Uh, we've taught this a number of times, but while we're here, we need to bear it out once again. We have two uh, Greek words here that really give us insight into what Paul is saying. The word conform comes from a Greek word that means to be fashioned or molded. And so when we're talking about don't be conformed to the world, we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, just like a Jello. Uh, how many love Jello? Yeah. I like Jello. <laughs> you know, I, I like a Jello. Now, to be honest with you, my favorite Jello is the orange kind because it tastes like the old orange bear aspirin. And some of y'all remember those children aspirins with the orange? The, yeah, they were good. <clears throat> That's why kids would eat it. They, they wouldn't mind taking the aspirin because it tasted so good. And um, so anyway, you could pour your Jello. If you take the jello, important they and they used to a lot of times had these molds just for jello. You pour it in there and it comes out, it has little faces on it, little designs in it, or whatever. And uh, you fashion or molded that liquid mixture, you know, when it's hot and you pour it in there and it has to sit in the refrigerator for about four hours and then it gels or congeals. And then when you turn it over and dump it out, it's, it's molded in the shape of the mold it was in. And Paul, that's what that word means, to be conformed or to be molded or fashioned. How? According to, the, uh, to this world. Don't be conformed. Don't be molded. Don't be fashioned to this world. So the world has a mold. And the devil wants to try to push you into that mold so that you come out looking and acting like the world. But we're encouraged by the Apostle Paul, if you remember verse 1, he says, present your body as a living sacrifice. That means you're going to have to do something with your body that is not going to be pleasing because it's a sacrifice. Yeah. See, if it was easy, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. You know, if you're, if you're sacrificing something, that means it's costing you something. And let me tell you what it's costing you. It's costing you trying to live in the pleasures of the world and being like the world and thinking you can get away with it. So ministers that teach that are, are just teaching erroneous doctrine. They're not teaching the Word of God. You know, the, what we now is calling, being called hyper-grace, and then people like to call it radical grace. I call it stupid grace because it's not really biblical grace. Biblical grace does not permit you to live any way you want to and there be no consequences. No, biblical grace gives you the strength to say no 
or the ability to say no, but you have, still have to act on it. You can't go out and be fashioned or molded according to this world. So Paul says, be not conformed, fashioned or molded to this world. That's a command. That's not a request. It's not even a suggestion. And then he gives, that's what the, 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 the thesis is, don't be fashioned to the world. Don't be molded like the world. But, the antithesis, be ye transformed. Now, the Greek word transformed, or that we translate transformed, comes from the Greek metamorpho. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what word we get out of that. Metamorphosis. Okay? So, metamorpho. You know, to have a metamorphosis. So, so don't be fashioned. Don't be molded to the world, but the antithesis of that. Be or experience a metamorphosis. How? By the renewing of your mind. Now, James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to do what? Save your souls. Now, a couple more Greek words there over James chapter 1. Save is sozo. Now, it's used in reference to salvation of the human spirit, but it's also used in, in, in uh, referring to physical healing, also used in reference toward the restoration of something, also the restoration of your soul, not your spirit. The word spirit in Greek is pneuma. The word soul is a suke. Obviously, we get our word psychology from that, obviously. But <clears throat> so it's the word. So James says, be not, James says, um, <laughs> just went totally blank what James said. Glory, receive with meekness the engrafted, what? Word, which is able to do what? Restore, make sound your suke, your soul. The, the mind of man and the intelligence of man and the emotions of man are, reside in the soul of man. And so Paul writes and says, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not fashioned or molded to this world, but experience a metamorphosis. How? By the renewing of your mind. James is saying the same thing. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to restore, make sound your suke. Okay? And so the way that we break out of or resist or or, or, or um, refuse to be molded or fashioned to this world is to renew our mind to what the Word of God says. And then Paul goes on and says in that same verse, he said that you may be able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We've got a lot of people doing something to try to find out what God's will is instead of doing what God told them to do to find out what His will is. See, the Bible says if you if you will um, renew your mind, then you will be able to prove out what is God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. James says, receive the word of God, the grafted word, that's able to sozo your suke, restore, make sound your soul. Amen. Paul's saying that you break out of or you resist or you, you, you refute being fold, uh, molded or fashioned to the world by renewing your mind. And what, so we renew our mind with what? The Word of God. We renew our mind to who we are in Christ, what authority we have in Christ, what belongs to us in Christ, the image we have in Christ. But remember, <clears throat> James also said this. He said that we're to look into the perfect law of liberty. And for the man who does it is like the man who looks in the glass. For beholdeth, when he leaves the glass and walks away, he forgets what manner he, a man he is. We're to continue in the perfect law of liberty. Why? So that we can consistently see what, how God has designed us and what God has made us and what his will is. So it's good, acceptable, and perfect will. Now, a lot of people want the permissive will of God. I remember growing up, you know, God has two wills, his permissive and his, his perfect. Well, the truth of the matter is he really has one will, his perfect will. The permissible will of God is, okay, dummy, go ahead and do it if you want to. But you're going to pay the consequences for it. If you want to be dumb, you know, my dad used to have on his, uh, he had, had a board they used to call the wisdom board at work. And uh, there was different things on there. He's like, one of the things he had on there was this. It said, uh, a lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. Okay? And then one of the other things he had on there, you know, uh, you know that, that, 
but you know, if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. You can't, if you're going to be dumb, you've got to be tough. Why do you have to be tough if you're going to be dumb? Because dummy gets himself in a hard place. Then you've got to be tough to get out of it. So what's the best thing? Don't ever get in the hard place. Right? Well, how do we do that? We renew our mind to the Word of God. Now, let me say this. Paul said that don't be fashioned or molded or shaped to this world, but be transformed, have a metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. What happens? When the mind is renewed, you don't act like the world. We've got so many Christians today trying to figure out how they can be like the world and get away with it. Yet the Word of God says, don't be like the world. Have a metamorphosis in your mind and your thinking. Be transformed. Go through the metamorphosis of your, your thought life. Have it transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind to the Word of God. Why? So you will act different. One of the things, remember when Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, when Jesus was being tried, and they began to talk to Peter and, you know, and, 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 you know, they said, we know you're one of them, your speech does betray you. And then later on in Acts, it, it, it said this, they took note of them that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but what? They'd been with Jesus. What, you know, it's interesting that speeders, uh, speeders, Peter's speech, not speeders peach. <laughs> Hallelujah, glory to God. <coughs> Peter's speech betrayed him. What? Being around Jesus, what is Jesus? Jesus was the living word. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. The Logos is the entire embodiment of the counsel of mind or wisdom of God. Jesus embodied everything about the Father. Amen. Glory to God. He is God. He's the second person of the Godhead. We will never detract from the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he, was, he, he laid those things aside to walk on the earth as a man, but he was still the living word. And they hung around the living word, and what happened? Their speech changed. They hung around the living word. They acted different. They did not act like other Jews. They did not act like other people on the planet. They, became, they had a change because they had been around the Word. And the, so the Word of God teaches us that when we spend time renewing our mind to the Word of God, our speech will be different. Our actions will be different. It won't be you could be just like the world and go to heaven. I don't understand that mindset. What that simply is, it is a catering to the flesh. It is going to the lowest common denominator that you can get to and still try to make heaven. And I want you to know that's not how God wants us living. It's wrong. Oh, I can fornicate all I want to, but I'm under grace. It don't matter. I'm all, I don't even have to repent because all my sins are already forgiven. That's some of that's the stuff being taught. And it's just error. And, and sad to say, Sad to say, it's in, it's in our circles the most. In the word of faith, charismatic circles, they're the ones clinging to and, and, and falling after this teaching more than anybody else on the planet. And we're supposed to be word people. Well, if you're a word person, you'll live according to the word, not according to some doctrine that somebody makes up. If you're going to be a word, if you call yourself a word person, then be a word person. Judge it by the word. Live it according to the word. And if the word doesn't substantiate it, you know, you, and, you know of course, the, the new mantra all is about the love of God. God loves us. Yeah, God loves you. And because God loves you, let me, let me say this about, uh, uh, about God's love. God's love, and now I, 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 write me a Mickey Mouse letter. I just want to see how stupid some people are. I want to see how unlearned some people are, just so, I, just so I'll know. Go ahead and write the letter. That God's love means that I can do anything and it doesn't matter. He will still love me. He will still love you and you can still go to hell. Amen. See, well, a good God wouldn't send people to hell. And he's not sending people to hell. He gave them the ticket out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, the, um, the apostle Paul wrote over in, back over in Romans chapter 10, remember this, that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, or a better way of structuring it is that Jesus is Lord. 
and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Now, I know we have a lot of methods that we use to get people saved, and God will accept the heart action. You know, somebody says, you know, come on down to the altar and say, Lord, forgive me my sins, you know, that. Uh, but tr truly, it is the confession or the acknowledgement of his lordship, not his life preserver. Hello? That gets us into the kingdom. We, and what do you mean lordship? We submit to his authority. We don't get to come to him and get drug in the boat and still keep living the way we were living. Why? Paul right here in the first verse. Uh, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service. Paul's putting the emphasis on that. Let the spirit man rule and dominate. Some of these teachings are catering to the flesh. And why? Because it, people buy books and people go, throw lots of money in the offerings and people get all excited about stuff that don't even, that's not even Bible. It sounds good. It's a sound bite. We're a sound bite generation. We better stop being sound bite generation than be holy Bible book generation. If we're going to walk in the fullness of what God has for us. You've got to renew your mind so you can prove what is his good and acceptable and perfect will. Why? If you don't know the will of God, you can't walk by faith. Amen. Let me say this. If we, tonight we have you know, 300 people in here and we give an altar call and say, listen, uh, come on down here tonight. We preach the salvation. You're going to go to hell, and, but Jesus came to redeem you, and he shed his blood to save you. Glory to God. And the good news is you don't have to go to hell. You just give your heart to Jesus. Now, come on down here tonight. You never know. This might be your night to get saved. Do you know what they can't do? They can't come in faith. Why? They don't know the will of God. It might be your night to get saved. When the scripture says that today is the day of salvation. If you will not harden your heart, but hear his voice. See, we have to tell people that right now is your day of salvation. Now, they, God said, so if I give them that scripture, today is the day of your salvation. If you're hardened not your heart, but you, you know, hear his voice, then you can come in faith because you know that God's word is that you, today is your day of salvation and so you know his will and when you know his will faith begins where the will of God is known once you know his will you can exercise faith in it amen now I know there's, there's things in a journey of faith where God says go do this and I'm going to do that there may be things that's unknown in that but say, you know he's already said I'm going to do this what did God tell Abraham? He said, you know, get out from your father's house, from your kindred, and from your family, and go into a place that I will show you. So he had faith to leave, knowing God was going to show him at some point in time where it was. And then God kept giving more information along the way, and his faith was able to grow in different places. Finally got down to the place at 99 years old. He said, Sarah's going to bear the son. And his faith, according to that which was spoken. Remember that? Romans chapter 4. His, you know, he believed according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Glory to God. And so when we, when we come to the things of God, just like coming into salvation, if I preach a whole sermon, you say, you just never know, this might be your day. What have I done? I have robbed whoever is there that is unsaved of any faith. Because they, they can't come. They'll come. And they may come with a heart that wants to, but because they're not in faith, they can't receive. Y'all are mighty quiet in this frozen chosen church. <laughs> Thought we were Pentecostal. Hallelujah. Word of faith, charismatics. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But if I tell that same person that to, the Bible says today is your day. Today is a day of salvation. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah. This is your day. They can come in faith. Well, the Bible said, it's, today's my day. But if I stand up like some dummy and say, you just never know, God might save you tonight. Now, there's two things that are evident there. One is, the preacher don't know what he's talking about. And two, there's no faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to know what the word says to have faith. 
And so the word of God is God's will. So we go back to this. Renew your mind. Don't be, trans, don't be conformed, but don't be mashed, mashed. Don't be fashioned. Don't be molded. I put two words together. I'm trying to cut the corners there. Hallelujah. Don't be conformed. Don't be fashioned. Don't be molded to this world, but be ye transformed. Experience the metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we find out God's will through his word. Now, there'll be some specifics that you'll be able to get in prayer, but it will still be based on what his word says as this. If you're called to be a missionary, you know, we, missionary really is, it's not even a biblical term. We use it. Uh, the ministry gift that would most likely uh, line up with missionary would be an apostle. They would go into places and they would establish churches and turn them over to other people, raise up churches and turn them over. And that's what missionaries usually do. They go into a place and they start a work. Now, traditionally what we've done is we send them there with their coffins. Back in the old days in England, they would pick up all their belongings, put it in the coffins, and, and they go off because they were never going to come back again. That's how they used to be. That's what missionaries used to do. And then when they died on the field, they put them in their box and put them in the ground. They were never coming back. Man, things have changed, haven't they? Now everybody, yeah, you, you got to know you're called then. You didn't go on whim then. You didn't go because somebody prophesied you're supposed to go there. You know, we better get them and bring their casket too. So they can tell you, when, tell you if you're supposed to leave or not. But, um, you know, we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. So we have ministry gifts and callings. And those gifts and callings, you know, the, the, of course, the evangelist goes. You know, you can have it. If you're preaching the gospel here as an evangelist in America and you go to Africa, you're still an evangelist. We call them missionaries because they went to a different country. All right. Uh, apostles are ones who go and stay, and they would build in the region. They would build and develop the church, and they would turn it over and move somewhere else to do that. So they're, they're church builders, or, you know, they build churches, okay? But even if I go to Africa, I would still be a pastor if I was in Africa. Now, in America, we would call me a missionary. I, I, I would just be a pastor who happens to reside, who happens to be from America, but I reside in Africa now, okay? So if the call of God comes, and I, I'm getting ready to go, now, there's no scripture that says, Ed shall go to Africa. There is a scripture that tells me that God calls. He gives gifts. And he and gave gifts unto some men, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Okay? Therefore, if I'm called, God speaks to me, I still have word that under, undergirds that verbal or that in, inner calling if it's verbal or if it's a still small voice or if it's the witness of the Holy Ghost. We talked about that a, few, uh, a couple weeks ago in, in on Sunday mornings. Uh, the voice of God, the, the, the still small voice, the uh, voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, the inward witness. Okay, we talked about those things. And so if I have that, I'm proving out, I'll still be able to prove out it's God's will by the fact that the word says he's, he's called son to be apostles and prophets and evangelists. In other words, I have a written word that, is undergirding or the foundation upon which this, this revelation I have about going to Africa is still built on a written word. I mean, I have a scripture that says, Ed shall go to Africa, but I have scriptures that say God called people to do these different gifts. Okay? And you get some whacked out crazy thing out there. Now, God told me that I ain't, I ain't supposed to have no kind of church. Well, we don't believe in churches. We, we have a house church. We're a New Testament church. Love that one. Who's the pastor? We don't have a pastor. Oh, really? What do you have? We've got it. We, well, there's, there's somebody here. We just, he, he's, he's really good. Now, they had, they, they had churches in the beginning, and then it began to grow. And in, in the beginning, they set elders or older people over the churches. And then Paul wrote to the church. He said, the, the, the labor is worthy uh, uh, to, to, to take care of the labor, especially the, the elders. The elders are worthy, uh, especially those who labor in Word and deed. So the church was growing, and the ministry gives. When the first church first started, you didn't have a bunch of pastors. They were all babies. And you had Peter, James, and John running the thing. Fifty days before, Peter's cussing and denying the Lord. He had some growing to do. Okay? And we went like he was hot shot rocket scientist, you know? Uh, you know, Jesus said, I've prayed for you that after you're converted, you'll strengthen the brethren. All right. So they were the pillars of the church to get started. And they, they were, they had a lot of growing to do. 
But over time, when Paul's writing these letters some 30 and 40 years later, okay, or 20 or 20, 50, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years later, he's writing these letters, the church is growing and it's growing out of the stage of just having everybody getting together and hanging out and singing kumbaya and not having a pastor we believe in house church. It's unbiblical. They were to grow and to have, being set under authority. And then he talks about, and, and Peter writes, he talks about you know, they're submitting to the shepherds so they can give an account of your soul with joy. So things grew and established. We're going to go back to the New Testament model. We'll go back to the end of the New Testament model and not the beginning of the book of Acts. We can, we can get experiences the same as they had in the book of Acts, but you can't run your churches the way they did. Not in the very beginning. Hello? They grew. And then Paul began to write letters on the order of the church. He wrote to Timothy, his young... Boy, I'm covering a lot of ground tonight. I only went through two verses. Looks like Romans chapter 12 is going to be a long chapter. Hallelujah. But Paul, you know, you know um, don't lay hands on anybody suddenly. You know, instructions for being a deacon or for being a bishop. You know, there's different things. Those things began to progress and, and, and grow in the church. We don't believe in house church. We don't believe in church. We have a house church. Then you have, you, you read just what you like to hear, and I'm going to tell you, a lot of that's just rebellion. Amen. Now, some people get saved. They're turning on the Lord. Somebody's got a Bible study going. They're going over there. But you've got to grow. You're going to have to find it. You're going to have to have a pastor. You're going to have to have someone to oversee your life. They're not, your, they're not your priests, but they are your pastor. We're all kings and priests or a kingdom of priests to our God. So we all have the right to go to the Lord for ourselves. But God said, I've given pastors, and what are they there? They're to the shepherd you. Now, not in that crazy 70s shepherding stuff. That was lunatic stuff. Pastor, can I go on vacation this week? Nope, I don't think, I, I sense you shouldn't go. Can I marry this person? Nope, I'm your shepherd. I'm, you, know, you, you can't marry that person. Now, I might sit in my office and tell somebody, I don't think this is a good idea. And I have done it. And they went ahead and got married anyway. And if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. Now, let me say this. Some people are all for stuff when I say it's not a good idea. And then after it gets going down the road, they get against it because the things are going rough. And then they come to me and I'm like, hey, it's God's will now. Why? Because you committed to that. I'm not going to jump up there and say, no, nah, I told you you shouldn't have got married in the first place. Divorce. No, work through it. You need to work through it. The time to say no was before, not after. That went over big. Hallelujah. Boy, I, I'm, I'm so far, I'm trying to figure out how I could get back. Glory to God. So back here to the will of God. That's where we were talking. We got off on that whole missionaries and, and you know, going on to see, being, you know, proving out the will of God. It, when you renew your mind to the word of God, then when the Holy Spirit, remember this, the word and the spirit agree. Remember that? John said that in, in, in 1 John, that the word and the spirit agree. Okay? That means when your mind's renewed, you've been transformed, and you're no longer fashioned to the world. See, when people don't renew their mind, they're fashioned to the world. Somebody comes along with a crazy doctrine, they'll think like the world thinks about it. A lot, of this, a lot of this extreme teaching on love that's out of balance with the Word of God has come from people's carnal concept of love. See, they think love means you let anybody get away with anything because you love them. That's not even healthy. In a marriage relationship, that's not healthy. If your husband walks in and smacks you every time he walks through the door and, you, and you, people say, you got to stay with him because God, you got to love on him. That's not healthy. Okay? That's, it's really a warped love. There are women who stay with husbands that beat them because they're afraid of going somewhere else. That's warped. That's not love. And it's warped to think that living, consistently living in sin is okay with God because he's already covered your sin and it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to heaven, you're under grace. That is a warped relationship with the love of God. Yeah. It's not right. It's not proper. Because if you really, let me say this, love with God is not a one-way street. We love him because he first loved us. Okay. God does extend his love first. That is a grace. Yes. 
but the reciprocation of that is because he first loved us, and I am not conformed to this world anymore. Why? Because the conformity to the, the, this world is enmity against him. This world is contrary to God. God is holy. Amen. And then we said this last week, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So the reciprocation is we love God because he first loved us. What does it mean that I love God? If you really love someone, you will be desirous of pleasing them. Now, I know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For they that come to him must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But I'll be honest with you, I can't believe you're diligently seeking God and fornicating and thinking it's okay. You can't be seeking the face of God and doing that. And think it's okay. Now, maybe you have trouble with your flesh, and you're not keeping it under, and you're, you're struggling. But that's not the same thing as thinking it's okay, and that you don't need to repent. God is merciful to your unrighteousness. And he will extend mercy to you. But he does not put up with obstinance. When you resist the dealings of the Holy Ghost so that you can cater to the desires of your flesh, he don't put up with it. Now, give me, I want a Bible example. The church at Corneth. There was a young man in there, or younger man, and I'm telling you what, this guy must have been a jerk. His dad remarried. And then him and stepmama ran off and were coming to church together. Shacking up and shagging, probably. I must think they had to be. And they were coming to church acting like it was okay. And Paul got ticked off with the whole church. He said, this shouldn't be, this isn't even named among the Gentiles. Now, what in the world makes people think that homosexuality is okay if just shacking up with your stepmama's going to get you put out? We welcome all people of everything. You can't, we're going to have the pedophile section in your church? Come on. Let's be real. For 25 years now, if the things keep going the way they're going, what's going to happen is, I know this will never happen. Oh, yes, it will. They'll be coming in. They'll be passing laws allowing for pedophilia. Now, if you think I'm crazy, for about 30 years, NAMBLA, the North American Men Boy Lovers Association, has been working to get uh, human rights tack-ons to UN bills that permit me, uh, pedophilia. They've been working on it for decades. And those, they get tagged on, and, and then they get knocked off because nobody's going to let that go through. And they usually get on some kind of human rights thing they're trying to get. And if, the, if we sign off on it, then we're committed to the world courts to allow that in our country. They've been trying to get it on there for decades. Just like they've been trying to get homosexuality passed as a human right on, in the U.N. stuff. Now, so we're going to come in here, we're going to have you know, got the pedophiles over here, the adulterers over there, the homosexuals over here, the lesbians here, you know, the straight, normal people here, and we're all sitting in our church, and we want them all in our church, and we're never going to say anything about it because we want to come to our church and put their money into our offering plates. And we want to accept and affirm their lifestyles because they have gifts to give. They ain't got nothing to give until they're born again. Yeah. You don't have anything to give. Because your righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeah. You are unrighteous before God. Yeah. And God will not let unholy things come into his presence. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Ichabod gets written. The spirit of God has departed. Written over the doors of your church and over your life and everything else. How do these things happen? Because people miss. They, they think God's love is a one-way street. No, God said he loved the world, and because he loved the world, he gave the answer to their sin problem, but the answer to their sin problem required an action on the part of the recipient of that restoration or that salvation. 
What was it? Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then Paul, now remember Jesus is talking under an old covenant. Paul writes to the church in a doctrinal letter in Romans chapter 10 and says you've got to confess the lordship of Jesus. You submit your life to him. What did Paul say to the Lord when he saw him on the Damascus Road? What will you have me to do? Lord. He submitted to him. And so we come to this place where God's love is being extended, you know, but if we're going to know God's will, we've got to go according to his word. And his word tells us that he loved us. We love him because he first loved us. And my love for him demands that I walk in accordance with his will and his word. And if God is holy and the stench of sin is repulsive to him, then we should not be engaging and living and doing that which displeases him. So we have to offer. Now your body, they love it. Hello? Your body may enjoy it more than anything in the world. Getting high, you know, smoking dope, shooting up, fornicating, committing adultery, whatever else it is. You know, watching pornography. Whatever else it is, you can just dream of that just satisfies the desires of your flesh. God's word says to give your body and offer it as a living sacrifice. Meaning these things that are just pleasurable to God, that rebel against God, that, that, that go contrary to his holiness, you are going to have to put on the altar and sacrifice it and say, no, I will not be molded and shaped according to this world, but I will be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I think like him and I act like him and I do like him, be imitators of God as dear children. Does God fornicate? No. He doesn't. no. Are you here? Then we're to imitate him. Does God commit adultery? No. Then we're to be imitators of him. Y'all here, you go home. God smoked dope? Nope. You got people going, around, Jesus used to smoke marijuana. You, where in the world did you come up with that crazy mess? Some drug addict said it in his, you know, the, the, the marijuana Bible or something. I don't know. The bong Bible. Got a revelation from God. Jesus smoked dope. You don't have any proof of that. And I can tell you from what the word of God says, he never did anything like that. Yeah. Well, the Bible says he was a wine bibber. No, 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 go read that better. He said that John the Baptist was one thing, and he said, and you say of me, here comes a wine bibber and a gluttonous man. He said, you said that, not him. That didn't mean what he was. Just said, you said that. Right. Hello? So you didn't just say, so that means it's okay to be a glutton. Doesn't it? See, people use that scripture to support drinking wine you got then go be a glutton. Because according to that interpretation, Jesus was a glutton, and he wasn't, and he wasn't a wine drinker. Not, not the way we're thinking about it. Remember, the same Greek word for grape juice and wine were the same word you had to take it in context. They didn't have a different word. They didn't have one for alcoholic. They didn't have another word for, for non-alcoholic. It referred to the fruit of the vine. So that means it was fermented. Everyone was, you know, they said millennials are buying and drinking so much now, wine now, they're buying about a five-gallon jugs. You know, the five-gallon plastic things. Where they just, not even bottles, it's the, it's the box, the box of wine. Because they just, you know, drinking it like crazy. Well, I'd rather just walk with God. Can you say amen? And I'm trying to wrap this up. But I, can't go, I cannot get off of here and go home. We're just going to quit here and go home. How about it? We good with that? Hallelujah. Anybody blessed? Yeah. When we prove his good, perfect, and acceptable will, when we, don't, when we offer our bodies living sacrifice, when we do the right things, we walk in God's pleasure. Everybody say God's pleasure. Glory to God. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org 
and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.